What's up, everybody? I'm The Hook. And I just woke up. <laughs> and together we're... <laughs> you know. Jesus. <laughs> Welcome to The Hook Blade Podcast, a show about all things... Assassin's Creed. I'm your host Lawson. Hold hold on. You have you have to th- you have to do uh, like a play on the on Odyssey. You have to do it. Oh God, I do, don't I? I forgot. Welcome to the Malacca Blade. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the the Greek Blade podcast. Let's go with that. <laughs> the Greek Blade Oddcast Odyssey. <laughs> no, fuck it. I just I can't do it, man. I know it's okay. Oh shit. I think one of my dogs just just ran into a wall. <laughs> Dude, it's been a while. Yeah, it has. It, I, I want to say it feels good to be back, but then I'd be lying. I'm, I've missed you so much. Well, I'm okay. I should, I should, I should, <laughs> I should elaborate. I am not happy to be back to talk about what we're talking about today, but I am happy <laughs> to be talking to you, Lawson. Aww. <laughs> you're so sweet to me. <laughs> yeah. We, we decided to bite the bullet and we, we had ourselves a Greek adventure, I'll say. We we did we did the nasty and we played Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, so Tim, I guess first question, just to kind of you know lay it all out there, put our cards mm-hmm. on the table. What did you think of Wrath of the Druids? Did you play it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I would like to talk about it, but I've already forgotten everything that happened in it. Yeah. Uh, I I would say the same, but I only I only got past the the the, the title sequence. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't you you didn't uh, <laughs> you, you weren't you weren't desperate to uh, learn Avor's connection to Ireland. <laughs> I was not desperate to learn the wrath of the druids. <laughs> the wrath of the druids. Why are these druids so damn angry? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Ask ask God. What was fun about Wrath of the Druids for me since and I'm just going to spoil it cuz I know <laughs> you don't give a shit. Yeah. Is that there are all of these like tropes that just keep happening in the arcs in Valhalla. It's like, oh, we've got a boy king, reluctant boy king. Oh, we've nice. got a mysterious lady. We've got a we've got an old viking friend of Eivor's from the old country. And they're all all just ma- mashed up and and they just said, oh, for this, for this, we'll just keep it simple and we'll do all the tropes again. I can't even name all the fucking boy kings or, or, or almost kings in Valhalla. It's like the only characters they know how to write on this son of a bitch. I don't get it. All I know is Wrath of the Druids is pretty boring. Uh, it, it's a little frustrating that I learned the werewolves are just kind of a hallucination. It's like. I would have preferred them just to go all in and the, the actual <laughs> werewolves in this story. Yeah, just like have a werewolf story. Like I would have preferred that. That probably would have made me play it. Who's the werewolf attacking the village? What's that about? No, nah, it's just when you do the trials things, you you go to the little altar and you take some shrooms and then you just fight a <sighs> fake werewolf. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, at least even though Wrath of the Druids isn't good. At least there was a great, high-quality Assassin's Creed game as recently as 2018 for us to play and talk about. Uh, which one is that? <laughs> Dude, Assassin's Creed 3 Remastered, of course. No, oh, um, yeah. No, we're, 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 we're going to talk about Odyssey. All right, so, I mean, here's my actual first question for you about Odyssey. Because Origins, you dreaded playing for years... And then you played it, and it miraculously wormed its way into your top three. I know. For reasons I still don't quite understand. <laughs> uh, so that gave me some... Not I won't say hope, because it's not like I want you to like Odyssey. I don't like Odyssey. However, I did just think it would be fun and funny if somehow you liked Odyssey. Like That would be pleasing to me, <laughs> because... 
as you know, as I've said many times in this podcast, I very controversially prefer Odyssey to Origins. I'm sure you don't, but go ahead and 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 share with the class. Uh, yeah, I don't prefer it to Origins. I'd say the my ranking is in release order. So Origins first, Odyssey second, Valhalla third. So okay, I think Odyssey is better than Valhalla. Very my like. Not by much, you know, because there's parts about both that I don't love. Yeah. But I, I I spent about just under 40 hours doing Odyssey. And I mean, it felt like a like a lot, but truly it wasn't that much. Valhalla was a big commitment. Yeah. And uh, I didn't quite enjoy every moment of it. And I didn't enjoy every moment of Odyssey, but there are more moments of Odyssey I enjoyed than moments in Valhalla that I enjoyed. I will say, and I suppose this could like, kickstart our first kind of like bullet point i guess about odyssey it truly feels like the only game in the in this series as uh that i've played besides valhalla of course that does not feel like an assassin's creed game um yeah like there are element like origins you know dances on that knife's edge a little yeah. bit it flirts with that line but odyssey straight up I don't think it like straight up does not deserve to be called odd uh, Assassin's Creed. And if it had been subtitled or something that would have been less egregious, I think, but overall, yeah, for sure. Like there are just so many elements of it that feel so foreign to the series. And I always was aware of that, but actually getting to play it, I now realize how, how, just how alien it, it does feel compared to even origins, you know, like the yeah. dialogue choices, that's a big deal going from Origins that at least has a, narr- a, a a linear narrative, you know? And, like, just the fact that seeing a mo-capped cutscene in Odyssey is a surprise, <laughs> it's, 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 it's crazy, you know? Yeah, I will, I will agree with that point. Even though I prefer Odyssey to Origins, it's certainly not on any grounds to do with having a more Assassin's Creed-friendly experience. For sure. Like, it's not like I'm out here going... Odyssey really made me feel like an assassin. Like, For of sure. course it didn't. Uh, the stealth is busted up. The, you know, build system is a pain in the ass. The dialogue choices are not fun, you know? Not really great for the most part. I just think that, I guess my, I, I've said this to you recently, but I don't know if I've said it on the podcast. The way I tend to contextualize the three in the myth trilogy, which it's difficult because I pretty much don't like any of them. But I also, there are a couple things that I like about one over the other typically. And so it's it's difficult for me to wrap my head around like what my actual ranking of them would be as a group. But I found that at least in terms of story, Origins was not very ambitious, not very well executed. Odyssey story was not very ambitious but I think pretty well executed. I think the story actually works decently well. Valhalla, very ambitious, not very well executed. So on those (laughs) two spectrums, really, they all have these, they all chart these different points. I guess more or less, uh, my feeling is that I think Odyssey's actual narrative is like structurally works pretty well and is kind of underrated by the community at large. And I also found on this playthrough, more directly comparing it to Origins, that some of the slightly more systemic design choices, things to do with the open world and with the mercenaries and with the cultists and various systems that are just that are given a little bit more breathing room in this game, I found that experience to be a little bit more satisfying. I felt like more convincingly like the world was a world mm-hmm. then I then I think Odyssey gets credit for. But other than that, the combat's still pretty terrible, even though I know I you're gonna hate me that I like it better than Origins combat. <laughs> and you know, I'm hitting a lot of points. I'm getting kind of my main thoughts out there, but let me sure. know if you would like to respond to any of them. Oh well I, I just wanted to <laughs> touch I wanted to res- I wanted to say something about the mercenary system because I do yeah, have a note about it. that and you brought it up so I feel like that's a good time to do it. So Mercenary system is interesting because I liked it at first. I yeah. thought it was like at first it put me in a lot of interesting scenarios, worked out pretty 
well, like I like that there was a bunch of a bunch of them. They were unique. They had like special little abilities, and it does have that systemic flair where they just kind of pop up. However, ha- I did have a problem with it as the game went on. It it, it became kind of pu- uh, punishing, especially like with how they can just pop up pretty much right next to you. Yeah, that that was a little frustrating. I found myself with a bounty almost at all times, and I felt like yep. it was mainly because I was doing things that the game incentivizes me to do, and so. I understand that that is necessary to keep the mercenary system constantly affecting you, because if it could just be lost in the background, then you're not really uh, um, you're not really participating in it. However, it sucks that the only way to, to 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 interact with this system is what is through ostensibly something bad. I'm interacting with the mercenaries because I've done something wrong, quote unquote, and I don't know if that's the best way to do this kind of a system because it shouldn't always be a punishment. It, and and honestly, part of it to me feels like they were trying to do some kind of like GTA cop system because they yeah. show up almost instantly and sometimes and like I'll be in the middle of fighting a guy and the mercenary will come up behind me and, 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 and enter the fight. And yeah, sometimes like at, at first that was a lot of fun at other times like I'm just trying to do this mission, dog. Can you fuck off? <laughs> yeah, they're definitely a little aggressive. I had the exact same feelings where. The mercenary system is kind of a mixed bag. On one hand, there are things to like about it, as you said. I also just find the premise of here's a screen in your menu and there's this like linear lineup, this power ranking of mercenaries. And each time you kill one, you're moving up the ranking. You're getting more powerful. Like that is a yeah, it's an effective visual metaphor for progress. It, it makes me want to kill mercenaries because I want to get further on the screen. However, at a certain point, the mercenary system exists more or less entirely as just one of the many, many ways in which Odyssey uh, says, fuck you for trying to do stealth. Right. Because if you're in a fort and you've got a mercenary on your ass, like they're because their AI is very like you can tell what they're doing. They will walk pretty much right up to about 40 meters away from you and then they'll just start circling you. And if you are seen by them or anyone else in that moment, then they're on you. And obviously fighting a mercenary while you're trying to be stealthy in a fort is not ideal. You can never pretty much one hit kill them. So you are left to either try very, very hard to not be seen by them or you admit defeat, open up your map and pay off the bounty. Yeah. Or you just say, oops, and you fight them and then you're out of stealth. And now the entire fort is on your ass because that's how stealth works. And yeah. they've lit the brazier. Reinforcements are coming. And you might as well just reload a save or jump off the side of the building, get to cover and meditate for a day. There there, there were then some instances at first where I was in a fort and a mercenary would come and I would just be in combat because I wasn't really trying to do stealth this playthrough. Yeah. And then I would run away and the mercenary sometimes would be left fighting the guards for me. And that always seemed like useful. Like I'm taking advantage of the system that didn't ha- happen very few and far between. And if I just feel like if the mercenaries just were, uh, were less often right on top of you, then those instances where they did pop up would be like tense. But when it's like every other fort, it's not exactly tense anymore. It's, it's just yeah. expected. I also don't understand why the mercenaries don't fight each other. Why are two mercenaries fighting me at the same time? Are they going to split the reward? Why don't they try and fight each other first? Right. Like, I had a five-star, five-star water level, whatever you want to say. Uh, I think it's five little Spartan yeah. that you can get all at once. Um, five little helmets. You were at five helmets. I was. I was. I had a five-helmet water level. And yeah. I think there were two mercenaries that started fighting each other. I don't know for certain, though. Like, I don't know if it's just some weird aggro thing where they somehow aggroed each other. I have no idea. But overall, like, yeah, mercenary system was a cool idea. I just feel like in execution, it's a little overpowered and it, and it happens a little too often to, to stay exciting. It would have been nice if there were more ways to interact with a mercenary system that isn't just you did something wrong. Here you go. Like, I would run into a mercenary like out on the sea and then that would make sense. Like, I can get some loot and oh, kill yeah. a mercenary at the same time. Cool. That was a really good example of sort of marrying the like oh, like the systemic right. design, keeping it like consistent with itself when you're on when you're in the naval gameplay, yeah, and, and <clears throat> having it exist across the world like that. I really appreciated. Yeah, and why can't I take up bounties on other mercenaries? 
there was like one I found throughout my playthrough that where I could go kill a mercenary. Like, why can't I take those those bounties? Like, there's no other mercenary wanted. Am I the only mercenary that is wanted in this in the in Greece? Also, actually, I found many times if you go to the message board, there are bounties on other mercenaries. Huh. All right, well, yeah, maybe maybe so. Then I guess I just missed them. But also, why can I not enter a fort, but other mercenaries can just waltz on in when they're looking for me? <laughs> That's annoying. <laughs> yeah, the mercenaries like they they telepathically uh, they all know they're on the same side. And you're just you you could never possibly be in someone's I mean that's the other thing too. We don't have to get too deep into this cuz I think we talked about it a lot when Blue was on the show. You guys can check out that first episode with him about um historical accuracy. I think it's episode 15 or something. Um I'll link it in the description. Um but the whole like red versus blue element where you have Athens and you have Sparta and there are, it's frustrating because there's not a lot of depth to like choosing a side. Obviously you're a mercenary. You're not meant to be choosing a side. You're meant to be doing whatever any of them ask you to do. Um, but <clears throat> one of the ways that breaks the illusion is just like you said, I mean, sometimes I'm helping the Spartans. I'm literally broing down with the wolf of Sparta and his son, and I can walk into a Spartan fort and they will all try to kill me. Like, I thought we were friends for now, kiddos. Like, why yeah. are we Why are we fighting? And that, honestly, that element pretty much led me to, for because for, for a time I was, like, trying to be strategic about it. I was like, well, who is more beneficial for me to help in this conquest battle? Yeah. Athens or Sparta? One is harder and one is not as hard, but I get better gear. But there's no long-lasting uh, 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 benefit to, to, to helping one over the other. I, nope. I, at a certain point, you realize if you just... Don't worry about like choosing sides or whatever and just do what conquest battles get you the most stuff. And, and that's the most advantageous position to be in. It's just and I guess yeah. what they were going for because you're a mercenary, but it's like Cassandra clearly has sy- sympathies for certain for, for certain Athens and Sparta people. So why like clearly she's not in the middle and just doing every just doing whatever costs uh, or, or sorry, doing whatever pays her the most like. Maybe sometimes, I, but there are definitely some times where she's emotionally invested. Her mother is like a Sparta's awesome. Why? Yeah. Like she obviously would would have this, a similar sentiment as at, a, at some point. Yeah, I there there are some things I appreciate about they aim for a certain complexity in their perspective, where it's like neither sides are objectively right or wrong because um, on in Sparta's case, they're sort of um, what's a good word archaic in their practices and they're sort of ruthless as a, as a culture, as a government, as a society, you know, they're training little boys to get killed by wolves and they're throwing kids off of cliffs. Cause the Pythia told them to like, they're not that cool or good, but also your whole family is fucking with Sparta. And, you know, it has that feeling of like, it's the closest thing you have to a home really, unless you want to count Marcos on Kefalonia, which fuck that guy. So there's that. And then with Athens, Athens on one hand is like, Hey, we're, we're bringing society forward. We've got the best thinkers and artists and we're democratic. And we, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're the future Sparta is the past. And that made me really want to fuck with Athens, but Cleon is a little, uh, piece of shit. And sometimes that system becomes, can, can be corrupt. Pericles was all right, I guess, but you know, plagues happen. So like, Both of the sides, it's not like there's one right, one wrong, and I appreciate that. I can see that that's what they were going for. But at the same time, my first playthrough, I spent wondering, like, what the significance of that system was, because I was constantly able, I could kill the leader in a particular area. Killing the leader only seems to matter if it's furthering some goal on the conquest map of making one side control it over the other. But there's never a goal in that sense. There's never a... I would really like for Athens to run Greece or vice versa. I don't even think if you wanted that to be your goal that you could actually accomplish it. I don't think you could kill all the leaders and finish all the conquest battles in a way that would give one side total control because they're kind of happening over and over again anyway. And sometimes they happen on their own and there's all this stuff. So it's just, it's a very, I appreciate that it's there as a system because it's something to engage with and interact with that gives the world a little bit more color, but it is really frustrating if you want to actually have it have any significance because it really doesn't to anything. Right. Else. 
and 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 the RPG element there does kind of actually get in the way because yeah, you're not going to be able to turn Athens over to Sparta, you know. No matter how much, no matter how much of the military strength you or nation power you you deplete in Athens, it's not going to matter. You can't do a conquest battle there, and so, yeah. because yeah, you know that that's just too ridiculous to, to to have done. And so you think about a game like Revelations that does the kind of you know two factions of enemies both hate each other and. I think that works in a linear game better because it's like, this is the world you inhabit, deal with it. And in Odyssey, it, it kind of pretends to give you a choice in the matter. It's like, well, if you side with Sparta, then your life will be a little easier, won't it? And it's it never is, and it won't ever be. And giving you a choice in the matter almost rubs salt in the wound because it's like, great. So now I have an illusion of choice in this system that's always going to fuck me in the end. Last thing I'll say about it is that the only difference between Odyssey's red versus blue mechanic and the the one that's present in Revelations and Unity and AC3 and probably other games I'm not remembering is that in those other games, the game doesn't pretend there's any wider significance. They are just factions. Both of them hate you, but they also hate each other. So have fun turning them against each other if you can with bombs or crowd control methods and just keep doing you because they don't really care about you and you don't really care about them. Odyssey tries to be like, well, they're, you know, there's, it explores the political motivations and disagreements between those groups better than any of the other games mentioned, which is cool. But it also gives it that layer of paint where there's a map and there are sliders and you can give one side more control over the map. You can you can affect the the outcome. But as we've already explained, you're not really affecting shit. Something else that we we kind of explored a moment ago when talking about the mercenary system that I want to jump into because I had a different experience in this playthrough than I did on other ones is the whole idea of just stealth. And the build system in Odyssey, because I've had so many Odyssey stands tell me or just say, and and I've heard them, that if you don't don't think you can do stealth in Odyssey, it's because you're not building your character right. (laughs) And I thought maybe there's some truth to that. So what I'm going to do on this playthrough is I'm going to try to uh, make a stealth character. I wore the Ezio armor, which as far as I had or could tell, uh, you know, got you the best bonus. Now, there's one thing I will say that a lot of stealth builds on the internet tell you to do that I did not do, which is there is apparently an engraving you can get that turns your, essentially it turns your crit chance into your damage, but, or your assassination damage, but it caps your health at 25%. And Either I didn't have this engraving in my menu or I did, but I decided not to use it because um, I get nearly killed all the time in open combat and getting reduced to 25% health was not going to be viable for me to not get desynced all the time. So I'll, I will give the caveat that maybe without that engraving, maybe if I had that engra- engraving, I would have had a, an amazing stealth experience in Odyssey. But even with all of my gear and all of my engravings and all my stats directed solely towards what gives me the most assassination damage percent? Um, what is going to be the best for an assassin playthrough? Um, it's still pretty miserable because you're still going to run into enemies you cannot critical assassinate at all, and you're still going to run into mercenaries left and right. Now, I will say this: later in my playthrough, I thought I I, I had to go into the settings for some reason. I was looking at the gameplay settings, and I, I I saw that you could change the level scaling. And I thought, hmm, changing the level scaling actually might go a long way because, right. you know, if I had fewer enemies that I could not one-hit kill, then certainly my stealth experience would be a little bit more frictionless. And sure as shit enough, with light level scaling, I actually had a good stealth experience. It was actually kind of similar to just playing Origins. Uh, that combined with pretty much paying off the bounties whenever there was a mercenary on my ass in a fort, because uh, Lord knows I had the coinage. Uh, yeah, not too bad. I could do it. So I guess there's that. But I still can't give the game too much credit because that's still like 30 hoops you have to jump through just for the sake of having like a basically functional pillar of the game. You know, they say it's a pillar of the game design. You can do this shit in stealth. Making it kind of work was that difficult, but it still works a damn sight better than it did in Valhalla. So credit for that. 
there's there's definitely a lot of steps you had to go through. And I'm also wondering, like, let's say if I was trying that on my first playthrough. Oh, no. Yeah, that's the thing. I was on New Game Plus. Right. You know, it just it just speaks to like how the RPG mechanics are actually built into like this game's DNA from the ground up. Like it forces you to con- consistently be participating in its systems and grinding and grinding because bow is not a is not also doing damage because of its bow. It's also doing how much hunter damage you have on the rest of your set. So yeah. if I just want to be an archer, I can't just worry about getting a new a good bow. I also have to worry about getting a good helmet that has hunter damage or a good chest piece that has helmet da- or hunter da- helmet damage, hunter damage. And I have to worry <laughs> about engravings that help me with my hunter damage. And it constantly is this vicious cycle of Welcome to the Helmet Blade damage cast. I can't just get a good bow like I could in Origins and then be good at archery. And it just it just keeps you in the grind so ridiculously. And that's why Origins yeah. to me is so much less egregious as an RPG game because a lot of that shit is craftable. Go hunt a fucking elk and you can build a stabilizer glove and get some bit better archery damage. The level scaling in Origins, I feel like, actually works like really well to your favor, whereas in Odyssey, it's meant to continuously be punishing. In Origins, though, it works out because you're constantly finding new weapons that do more damage. And so that means you're constantly getting nice bows and you're not stuck with not being able to do the archery that you want to do. This game says, fuck you. You have to do that. <laughs> yeah, because there's so many different categories for, like, you know, every single piece of your character. You can go several levels without getting an upgrade to a particular item. You know, like, I'm level 62 now, let's say, but my bow is level 54 because right. I found plenty of helmets and chest pieces and boots and shit, but nothing that was, uh, you know, a, a, a helmet. Yeah. I mean, of course, Origins is going to be, like, objectively simpler because of... Yeah. It just having weapons only, but I felt like Origins was always like kind of generous with giving you better weapons. Like by a certain point, I had the sword I wanted to use forever, and I just kept upgrading it, and it didn't cost yep. much to upgrade it. I didn't have to engrave it or do any of that garbage. It had default bonuses, and that was it. That just kind of speaks to like Origins is incentivized to give you a good archery experience because that's how you deal with a lot of stealth. And Origins does have that stealth system that's that's prioritized. Odyssey doesn't even have smoke bombs. So the stealth system yeah. is not prioritized in that, in that game or in this game at all. What was I going to say? Yeah. What, what were you going to say? I was going to say, you know, a lot of people have this idea that with Ubisoft or, or with games in general, it's like, because like literally there was this dumb ass clickbait headline going around that was like, Ubisoft confirms an investor call that Assassin's Creed will never be stealth again. And it's like, okay, so I clicked, wh- where did they say that? What did they say? Uh, no, they just said that RPG mechanics were here to stay. And a lot of people have this idea, reasonably so, considering these past few games, that if they go with RPG mechanics, then stealth is not going to be good. And while I see why that is, um, because as I've explained before, I think it's pretty clear that Ubisoft knows it is easier to monetize and incentivize microtransaction purchases off the back of in- increasing or improving your combat stats. Like, I'm going to buy this gear because it has better stats that'll make combat easier sort of thing. Whereas, you know, it's not really quite the same to to motivate those decisions on the grounds of making stealth better. So it is certainly the case in these games, Origins the least, Valhalla the most, that like the game is actively fighting you um, from being stealthy. In Odyssey, it was the you know the mercenaries and the level scaling and critical assassinate. In Valhalla, it's the fact that detection is broken and social stealth doesn't work. In all of these games, they're saying, "Oh, you want to be doing stealth? Uh, fuck you! It's combat time." Or yeah. even just in Valhalla, the fact that raids are, you know, 80% of what you're actually doing in the game, and you literally just have to be fighting in those. So overall, it's definitely been the case historically, but it, there's no reason that a good RPG mechanics influenced Assassin's Creed game could not have proper stealth. Yeah, there's just no just reason. Just look at Origins. Yeah, there you go. You can do it. Stealth is possible. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And I know we talked about this like, you know, privately, but 100%. I don't think that just RPG mechanics being in AC means that stealth or any of those other classic elements are dead on arrival because Origins proves that to be not the case. Obviously, like you said, 
there has been a track record of, of those things not encouraging classic AC elements to stick around, but it doesn't mean the same thing as it will never be able to happen. You know, if we yeah. got another Origins next year, there's your stealth system that works. There's your RPG mechanics that aren't egregious. And yeah, I wouldn't have had that opinion before playing Origins. So I guess that's kind of a evolved position I have now in the RPG mechanics. So I agree with you 100%. Something I've been wanting to ask you about, um, we might as well get into. I've been saying for years now that Odyssey's story is actually pretty good. How do you feel about it? I think it's fine. There are, there are parts of it that I think are are good. Like about in terms of the family drama stuff, I think that's compelling. I think that's actually pretty, yeah. that's refreshing for Assassin's Creed. It's Thank to deal you. with like a fractured family instead of, oh, my dad died or my mom died. Well, what's neat is it actually has something of a propulsive dramatic question. In this case, the dramatic question is, can Cassandra reunite her family? And there are all of these different threads, of course, for each family member that spin out from that, that you have to go, all right, I met my dad. That was that was cool. Oh, I have a real dad. I guess I better figure that shit out. Oh, there's my mom. She's oh, but my, my brother's the bad guy. Like there are all these different sub stories within that that each kind of have their own hooks. And the question of can Cassandra reunite her family? Not only is it good as like a reason to be doing what you're doing in the game. It also is just a uniquely i think interesting entry point for an rpg story because it's not necessarily world ending stakes i mean they definitely for flirt sure. with that with the cult of cosmos like oh they're they are evil and if if they have control over our bloodline that would be really bad for the world but at the same time it's not ever really so much about that as much as it's about uh, can I get my family back together and what would that look like? And do I want the, those people back? And there's a lot of choice in how you handle that, how you handle those family members and the story at large. So like, even though I always give the the caveat that it's not a good Assassin's Creed story, there's no assassins in it. There's no creed. There's just Greek historical drama. And if that bothers an Assassin's Creed player, uh, well, it bothers me too. We're all in agreement. But I do think it is a well-written narrative. Like, I think that it plays out in a way that works and that I actually had some investment in what happened and in the choices that I made. So uh, are you are you saying pretty much like, you say it's fine. Is it not good in your opinion? Or is it just like, eh, it gets the job done? There are moments that are good, like the moment when she's like, the wolf of Sparta is my father. Like, that was yeah. actually like, wow, I actually am excited to see what happens next. I didn't even know that. And I, I've i talked about Odyssey with you many times. Can somebody confirm or deny? I, I had something of a Mandela effect experience with that line. In what way? I have a vivid recollection the very first time I played it. I was talking to you about it <laughs> in like DMs on Twitter because... I remember the experience that I was given a number of dialogue choices to, to select. And one of them was the wolf of Sparta is my father. And I thought that's such a cool line and I get to choose it. And on one hand, I think it's cool that I got to choose the line, but on the other hand, like if you don't choose it, you get a far less epic sort of title drop moment. And I remember talking to you about that because you were like, yeah, it's bullshit. What if I don't choose it? Then I don't get the cool line. But I, I replayed it and I even like checked this against, like I looked at videos of gameplay uploaded from 2018. It's never a choice. You just say it no matter what. And I don't, Maybe I don't you're know. thinking about like talking about Demos. I, I was specifically concerned with it as a title drop line, as the well, moment. Yeah, right. They... But what, what I'm saying is like perhaps like, what you, your recollection was like, because you, yeah. you, you uh, Varnavas, you can tell him that it, Demos is your brother, actually. Or so I think it's Varnavas, at least. So, like, maybe that's what yeah. you're thinking of. Maybe I got to be mixing it up with something. Because but. I remember that conversation and I remember you telling me something about your brother is the bad guy. Mm, maybe. Uh, who knows? This was like maybe. 16 years ago. So. All right. I just wanted to throw that out there as a Mandela effect possibility. Write in the comments if you remember having to choose to say the one who's <laughs> part of killed my father. I, I do want to say, can I, I want to I say, I want to say something about Demos, if I may. Please. So this is, this is, uh, this is great. All right. So the thing about Demos, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is 
probably like the best instance, but it's one of many. But it's probably the best example of if this game was led specifically by Cassandra, as we are we we believe is what the original intention was, that Demos reveal would have been ten times better. Because the marketing being flooded with Alexios's face, I know instantly that that's Alexios. I know that's that, that is the other sibling. I know that that's her brother. It really deflated the moment. However, if I just saw Demos and thought, well, that's a handsome lad, and didn't know that that was her brother, then I would have had that reveal with Cassandra. I would have been like, whoa, what is Cassandra acting so weird for? Like, the fact that in that moment when he presses her hand and they both kind of experience the memory, like, that is awesome and would have been amazing had I not known that was Alexios. So Hmm. that all kind of comes around to, like, if Cassandra was the marketed person and I wasn't so inundated with what Alexios looks like and sounds like, that would have been a reveal instead of just, oh, it's more of a development now because I know about Alexios already. Obviously, I knew that Demos was the opposite sibling, so I knew that going in. I still would have recognized Alexios even if I didn't know that Demos was the opposite sibling because I've seen the trailers for the games. (laughs) Yeah. It was, at least at the time, a relatively interesting choice to have the other gender character be automatically the villain in a way that like you didn't know that was necessarily going to happen unless you were following leaks and rumors. And it was kind of cool just on the concept alone of like, oh, I could be playing as that dude, but he's the villain. Like, And that's not something you'd think if you are so removed from the possibility that... But, but also, like, there's no world in which they don't market one of the protagonists at all. So they were never going to be preserving that surprise. You were even going to see their face when you were choosing which character to play as. So I don't think there's any world in which... Well, no. Well, that what I'm saying is that's if Cassandra is the main playable character. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're not saying what if the trailers didn't focus on him so much. You're just yes. saying if there was no choice of gender yes. protagonist, then that moment would be more effective. Yeah, you're right. It's still a cool moment. Don't get me wrong. I just think it's deflated because, okay, that's the guy from the trailers. I know him. And that's the thing. Like Moments like that, moments like the Nikolaus encounter on the cliff, moments like, you know, the, the prologue scene or some of the flashbacks, like there are all of these scenes in the game that they're actual scenes. And I, I, that doesn't sound like, like a glowing review, but you look at (laughs) origins and so many of the scenes are not scenes. There's no change of, character motivation there's no push or pull there's no shifting power dynamics there's no tactics there's no motivations there's no i want something and i'm trying to get it and we're seeing how that conversation is playing out it's like all entirely just bayek and other people uh just delivering exposition it's just bayek and aya talking about the people they have to kill and they miss their son and it's not a scene the character's not learning anything new the, yeah. there, there's no emotional experience on, on display. It's like, it's just not telling a story in Odyssey. It's telling a story pretty much the whole time. As far as those main story centerpiece moments are considered. And so even Valhalla, like, I think while it's much better than origins, as far as like having those kinds of storytelling things actually happen in their scenes, Valhalla starts to fall apart on a more broad structural perspective of like, we really just spent a hundred hours on this story and it's Mm -hmm. really not that deep, you know? So, so I, I give Odyssey a, a a golf clap. Yeah. Um, I guess there's two things I wanted to say based off what you just said. One with the scenes in Odyssey are, yes, they're like, they're well acted and well written, but not only that, but they look incredible. They're actually like, directed there's like a cinematography there's 100 like, <laughs> there's there's a cinematography and there's like a look and a feel to them and they are yeah. amazing they're some of the best yeah. like cutscenes i've seen like i was so surprised about that and i can't help but think what if this was just the game and <laughs> there were no like ridiculous like back and forth ab dialogue it, it'd be the, yeah. it'd be a, it'd be great and speaking of the wolf i guess i wanted to, i guess i could share the anecdote because uh, i decided to kill him yeah. Um, 
that moment was the best part of Odyssey for me because I chose to kill him and she like hangs him over the cliff a little bit and she's like, I want to see the light go away from your eyes, bitch. And then she stops and I'm like, okay, great. That was a non-choice then. And then pretty much as I am saying that, as if the game is responding to me, <laughs> she takes her spear out and stabs him in the tummy and it's great. And it's a mocap cutscene, and it's great. And then center comes up and it, it feels like a genuine moment and there's like action consequence and it's great. And I feel like the choice actually made that moment better because I got to choose how does Cassandra feel about in this moment? Is she holding a grudge since the day that that happened? Or is she just looking for reconciliation? And my Cassandra, yeah. I decided in that moment, was holding a <laughs> grudge this entire time. And she is ready to, to, to end him. And she finally got her revenge. Because essentially what happened is she let both her brother be sacrificed. And he then tried to kill her himself. So... There's no reason why she wants reconciliation with this motherfucker. And I understand, like, you know, if you feel differently about Cassandra because in that moment, because, of course, it's up to your choice. Yeah. The, 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 the other the double edged sword of that whole thing is I think this is the only choice in that in the entire game that has that kind of lasting consequence. And that actually feels like a choice. I think you might be right, because, I mean, my favorite sort of choice based moment is. Is also a side is also a response to Nikolaus, which is, um, you know, later on in my playthrough, I'm killing. I'm just I'm just sent by Stentor to kill like four random champions in Beotia. I don't know how it's pronounced, but there's like three O's in it and there don't need to be that many O's. I went to kill one of them on the sort of that little island fort in the center of a lake where you go and then the 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 champions on the you know yeah. near the near the viewpoint and when i go there th- there's nikolaos killing the the champion because he's going all right i'm you know i'm helping my son from a distance because i still believe in the cause but i'm also trying to figure my shit out and as cassandra i have a choice in that scene i can either say uh fuck out of here old man let me do my thing or I can be like, hey, your son needs you and he's being a whiny little shit. And I think if you just give him a hug and play catch with him for a few minutes, uh, he might like stop being such a diva. And <laughs> if you say that, then when you go to see Stentor later uh, in the moment where Stentor challenges you to a duel to the death, I don't know if it happens no matter what you choose, because I never chose to kill Stentor. But um, Nikolaos shows up and he's like, Hey, stop fighting, kids. And it just felt like there are a good couple of choices that led to that uh, sure. moment that allowed Stentor to still be alive at the end of the game. Yeah. Now, some of the wind was taken out of those sails by learning from you over DM that even if you try to kill Stentor in that first encounter, uh, he does survive and he shows back up so you can have this whole moment. I would have liked it better if if this was just a cool story moment that you never got to see. Right. Yeah. And it was exclusive to you. Yeah. Because there is something nice about there being moments that only certain choice players get to see. Yeah. But Odyssey, as far as choice goes, it's a mixed bag. We did a whole episode on dialogue choices and stuff back with Putrid. Obviously you couldn't really weigh in at the time because you hadn't played Odyssey. Um, But my, my, my greatest like, praise to the choice system is that there are at least a few moments in the story where you feel like you're making a choice and that you feel like that choice will will have consequences whether or not they end up really doing that is maybe a different story but at least the illusion of choice in those instances is powerful valhalla on the other hand like i don't think there is ever a single choice that really feels like it matters I think the one choice I remember from Valhalla as having to make any decision about was Ivar and whether or not I should send him to Valhalla. But then even though I didn't, all of his brothers treated me like they knew I had. Like they went, oh yeah, we know you gave him his axe so he could have a warrior's burial in Valhalla. And I felt like literally the game was just refusing to acknowledge a choice I made. So I can't even give it credit for that. I digress. Um, my, My criticism with the choices in Odyssey is how they lead into the endings. Because I want for for two things to be true about endings in regards to player choice. One is I want them to feel like there are natural consequences for the choices I made. 
and two, that they are, you know, substantially, well, actually, I guess it's just the one thing. Never mind. One thing. I want them to feel like, like the ending is a good, is a natural consequence of a choice I made, right? This is my third playthrough. Every time I've played through Odyssey, I've done it on the perspective of saving everyone's life and not killing anybody purely because I always wanted to save Demos and my first two playthroughs, I wasn't able to. And to my knowledge, the only reason I wasn't able to save Demos on my last playthrough was because I told my mom that I didn't think he could be saved. Wow, that, that's that's so funny because I did, and that must be why I was able to save him. <laughs> you were able to save him at the end. Oh yeah, that's that's wacky, cocoa bananas. Because yeah, I because I pretty much told her I was like, yeah, I'll bring him back, and then like an hour, like six hours later, I'm I'm back, and that choice I guess has some. But like literally, there's a moment on the mountain when you can either like be like, you're not leaving this mountain alive, or you can like try and reason with him. Why isn't yeah. that moment also integral? Well, I mean, I suppose it is because even if you do everything else right and you say, I mean, did you say I'm going to kill you in that moment or did you say, no, you're coming with me? We're family. Well, no. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's still integral. I, I guess let me rephrase. Like it is integral. But like, why could I say to my mom, hey, I don't think I can bring him back. But then literally when he is there, I am trying to bring him back and that doesn't work. That's silly. Yeah, exactly. That was that was silly because. I, I, and and maybe I'm just remembering wrong. And I I know the other choice that matters for Demos is what you tell him in that conversation about like the cult is using you when right. he v- visits you in prison. But I looked really closely at that conversation on this playthrough, and because I was worried of fucking about fucking it up again, so I looked up like what are the right responses to this that will actually bring Demos onto my side, and it's like really arbitrary the distinctions between those choices are not dramatic you're it's not like you're choosing between telling him hey the cult is using you and telling him hey you should stay with the cult forever like it's not a dramatic choice but there are a few specific answers you have to give in that conversation for him to feel like i'm not your puppet cleon and then to decide later that he might not be demos anymore you would not I, I think a reasonable player actually giving the genuine answers to those to those questions to that conversation could be fully well intentioned and trying to to save Demos with every choice they make and still make the wrong choices. So that part also frustrated me. When it comes to the dialogue choices generally, also, I feel like they just make for wildly inconsistent characterization. Yeah. And the uh, the amount of choices sometimes only being two options and they're like pretty much black and white. It's like, you can either have Cassandra say, I believe in honor or I believe in money. And it's like, well, maybe in certain instances she believes in money and in certain instances she, she, she believes in honor. It's like, it, that that's, that's like literally walking dead, like season one level of choice where in bet- they're literally scene to scene, you can have certain characters love you and hate you from scene to scene. It's like, <laughs> it's not consistent. Yeah. It's wildly inconsistent. And it, also, I don't feel like Cassandra has an arc in this game. No. Do you think so? No, I don't I don't really think she does have an arc. I, I think there are ways you could play her if you were trying to give her an arc. Um, you know, something I kind of played with on this run through is I had Cassandra start out by giving all the cocky answers. You know, you could be like, I am a god. Uh you could be like, you know, I'm XYZ, but then I started to kind of dial that back as as she was doing things that I thought would have given her more character growth and more perspective. That's purely something that I did for my own enjoyment. It did slightly deepen my character experience on this playthrough, but you know, who's going to do that? <laughs> I had to be three right. playthroughs deep to even know I could do that. So I feel like, um, I feel like mora- like morality systems in these, in these choice based games help with keeping you in a, in a, in a path. If you are, if you're going for like, you know, a certain morality, uh, uh, like a certain yeah. place on that spectrum, y- chances are you're not going to be deviating from that and, and making the inconsistent choices. And so that kind of keeps you with having a consistent characterization throughout. Yeah. Playing playing Mass Effect right now, I am Paragon as fuck. Right. And so, the, yeah, you have the option to, 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 to do Renegade in certain instances, but why would you? It's, it's, it's not advantageous. You know, right. and so perhaps you lose out on like true ultimate freedom because you're being punished for making a neutral or renegade choice. But, but if that gets you a better, more consistent story, 
uh, I'll take it. And there's a lot to be said for why those morality systems, they're kind of relics and, and I'm, I'm okay with them not being as popular as they used to be because it is kind of like a, a fairly simplistic and gamified it can't, yeah, view for of sure, morality. It but also I want to draw a parallel. You know, you said Cassandra has no arc in this game. You know, who would be the first to tell you that, that a story doesn't need a character arc to be good. Is it Darby McDevitt? Darby McDevitt would tell you that. And <laughs> he's told us that on Twitter. I want to, I want to draw a comparison to the ending of Valhalla because on some, on some level it does like kind of what, you would almost want this game to do like you almost want there to be some lenience. If I made a wrong choice here or there about Demos, the fact that I'm saying now at the end, Hey, actually Demos, uh, I love you and you're my brother and come back like that. Maybe that should triumph over those other things. Um, because I think in this instance, that would make some sense. However, you know, Valhalla sort of did that with Sigurd at the end where, um, spoilers for Valhalla, guys, if you haven't, <laughs> if you haven't played it, where you know you've made a good five choices at this point about whether or not you were respecting Sigurd's leadership, and as long as you haven't made more than like three of those five choices as anti-Sigurd, then you can choose at the end that actually you're my brother and I respect you, and he'll come back. This serves the idea you're talking about that you can end up having a character arc as Eivor some extent, where if you're saying fuck Sigurd the whole game, and then at the end you bring him back, hey, congratulations, you just arced yourself. Um, conversely, though, you know, it's not really that deep of an arc, and it also ends up feeling like your choices don't matter because you can undo them all at the end. You can essentially say that uh, every every single one of these major choices I made to say fuck Sigurd and I don't care what he thinks of me uh, actually will not have any consequences. It's not going to affect the ending. I also pretty much said fuck Sigurd in many, many, many moments. And yeah. I still have the option to be like, hey, buddy, come back with me. And he did. So, it, Right. It, it didn't feel like you had an arc. It felt like that the game wasn't like responding consistently to your inputs. Right. More or less. And Darby's statement on that at some point afterwards, it might have even been in a response to our episode on that Twitter thread where he was kind of saying, like, the ending of the game was not meant to be a referendum on the choices you made. And that sure is an interesting idea <laughs> that I, I understand. But also at some point you have to recognize you're coming up against these, these expectations people have for these games that if I'm playing a choice based RPG, you want your choices to have some weight in the end. If your choices don't have weight in the end, people get really pissed off about that. And I think they tried to thread the needle on that and do something where you're, you're not beholden to your choices entirely, but they are still have some impact. And I don't think that worked for everybody, you know? Um, which is fine. Not everything has to work for everybody. Yeah, it's so weird to be like, hey, in this dialogue choice, in, in this dialogue choice based game, uh, your choices actually don't really matter in the end. Like that's that's, that's <laughs> not uh, that's not a, that's not an encouraging. That's not a sign of yeah. encouragement. Not even a little bit. And and it's something that we have to think about and talk about because we spent so much of the lead up to Valhalla saying if if choices are here but less important, that could be good progress. In the sense that, like, maybe we would take a game where choices are sort of this surface level element that's just getting you more into the character, but aren't really affecting the story in dramatic, canon altering ways. That if you had proposed that idea to us in the lead up to Valhalla, we probably would have said that was a great idea, I think. And then I think Valhalla changed our minds about that to some extent. And playing Odyssey, I definitely come to the conclusion that if you're going to make dialogue choices, part of your game and you're going to say that they're a big part of your game do it better you know not than odyssey but than valhalla i think odyssey yeah i would have liked to see more done with the choices um even than odyssey already did but still i think when you look at some of the more the bigger the the big names of choice based games like even mass effect which like i said i'm playing through right now you know you get the you get the five or six big choices and the rest are just there to Bring you in. Bring you into the world. There's a moment where Demos is like, you profit from this war just as much as me. I mean, why do you care about who wins or whatever? And it's like, good point, Demos. Are you going to respond to that, Cassandra? I guess not. 
Never mind. <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. I suppose, I suppose like to, to, to truly answer your question, I don't think that there was any moment in the story that was bad. I just felt like it meandered a bit. And I guess that's just a consequence yeah. of the grind in an RPG game, not, not, not being able to consistently go through the main quests at all times. Um, yeah. I just felt like it, yeah, like, at a certain point, I'm like doing these random fetch quests for Stentor, and it's like I don't care about you; I care about my family. Um, yeah, I guess more Demos would have been interesting, uh, like just more Demos in general. I don't feel like I knew Demos very well, besides that he was my brother and he's corrupted. I definitely think it's fair to say Odyssey suffers heavily from fetch quest syndrome, especially oh God, in a lot of yeah. those side arcs. Run up to Hippocrates. Uh, hello, Hippocrates. I would like one plot point, please. Uh, oh, if you want a plot point, there are three <laughs> things that I need you to do. Okay, I'll go deliver medicine. Right, and that is in an advantageous position to be in as like at the center of a choice-based narrative because you feel at the mercy of other things and other characters. Yeah, you're constantly just doing what people are telling you to right. do when you wouldn't necessarily, if you had full choice, you would say, fuck off. Right. Like, that was one thing, like, you know, so a lot of the side quests give you the ability to, like, say... No, I won't do this, but that just means the side quest stays on your map. I almost would have liked if Ubisoft went full send, and if I reject a side quest, I say, no, I'm too busy for that. It just fails the quest, and it's no longer on my map. That would have been cool. And, and that's why the side quests kind of serve this fan the fantasy of this game better, because, yeah, you have the option to just refuse and not do it. You also, the nature of it being side content, it makes sense that it might be a little bit more meandering. Because yeah, it's it's completely optional, and you decide if that reward is worth it to you. Usually, yeah, there are things like, hey, go kill this person or go get this thing for me. Typical mercenary work. And if it's not exciting enough for you, then don't do it. And yeah. in the main quest line, you don't have that level of choice because you have to do it. It's 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 it's, it's uh, obligatory. Um, I will say, the best experience I had in Odyssey was getting on my ship. Sailing to an unknown continent. Well, not continent. What the fuck am I saying? An unknown <laughs> island in search of a cult member. Yeah. Great stuff. Uh, not as good as Valhalla's cult, but pretty close. You really feel like you're in control of the, you know, like when you're just hunting down cult members, it's like the only time in the game that it feels like you're doing something and you're choosing to do something and you're doing it the way you want to do yeah, it. Yeah, it's like I'm getting in my ship and I'm going and I'm going to go kill this dude because, and that's of my own volition. I am deciding that. Yeah. And it's a nice breath of fresh air from the constant tedium of the main quest of having to go and do things on other people's accord. I want to yeah. go and do this because I and that, that's what I'm choosing. And that is why the main quest line needs to just be the the, the cult tree and let you do what you want with it. <laughs> That's the ultimate yeah. mercenary choice-based thing that you could do. <laughs> fuck all this family stuff. Let's just fuck up the cult. Well, the, you would have you yeah, but you would have the family stuff like peppered in there. And yeah. I also think that's why the mercenary system feels a little awkward at a certain point because it's like, okay, now I have these two systems, cult and mercenaries. It would have been nice if yeah. there was a way to merge the two. Because I feel like after a while, you start putting the mercenaries in the background, and now you're worrying about the cult. would have been cool if the two kind of became one big more. entity. I don't know. I also will say uh, that my fa one of my favorite little just systemic interactions that, that I've probably ever had in an Assassin's Creed game came on this playthrough, where I'm standing at a message board, and there's an NPC woman, and she just, like, shoves me to, like, look at the message board. And I was like, you know, I'm going to kill this bitch. So I start stabbing her to death and i'm noticing that like this is her health is like way too resilient for like your average npc and sure enough as soon as i was done killing her uh confirm cultist kill i just randomly happened to fuck up an npc that happened to be a cultist i'm sure that's happened to plenty of people but it's like one of those like i mean it never really happened to me that way in, in my other two playthroughs so you know fun times yeah on that. Oh, yeah that's definitely cool between the cult and the mercenary and and then the naval the naval stuff that those things all combine to make me enjoy odyssey's world more than i enjoy origins which i know is controversial because a lot of people um really love egypt and really love the like level of detail and i've seen a lot of criticisms for greece and for odyssey's world 
about its design that maybe Jacers can DM me about what he means when he says it's really bad because I'm not sure I understand why. I feel like a lot of the things that make Origins World so detailed and interesting are still there in Odyssey, if maybe to somewhat lesser of an extent. But those systemic things and the naval element really just make me enjoy the world more. I enjoy playing around in it more. I love naval. I love sailing from island to island. And my only complaint is that naval is not as big of a presence in the game as I would want it to be. Yeah, It's not as necessary for for most of the the runtime of the game as as it is in you know black flag obviously also you kind of because most of the naval missions that you do in the main story like i something i loved about black flag naval is the sense that a lot of those naval encounters were really like handcrafted with p- specific terrain and like arenas that you'd be working in and there's this level design feel to it where this number of ships in these positions and this size and shape of an arena gets you a certain combat experience that feels handcrafted. I would have liked more of that here, but it's not really here. I suppose just like an anecdote about combat. I hate it. It's awful. But I did, <laughs> I did put an, I did put some energy into it. I, I decided to get a certain set of armor that I felt would, would, would be advantageous. I worked on getting certain engravings. I did all this bullshit so that I could have a ton of like fire and elemental damage. Yeah. And sometimes it would work out. Like I'd be able to wa- run into a conquest battle and I'd be able to light my blades on fire. And then if you do ring of chaos with like a poison or fire, it sends out that poison or fire in a wave around you, not just like a stun. So I never knew that. That's really cool. You can. Well, yeah. So I had level three ring of chaos because I only did the warrior tree. I didn't do any other trees. Fuck the trees. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I'd run in, do my level three, like, uh, fire blades, with, which has no cooldown on a, on a level three. Uh, and then I did my level three ring of chaos, and I would basically send, like, ten dudes just flying, and they would all have uh, fire damage on them. And so combat was fun at that moment. It was not fun for any of the rest of the moments while I was getting to that point. But it does I think we can give like- the combat system some credit for that, in that it, it was... It was- it allowed you to express your own sort of play style, your own sort of like, this is what my Alexios or my Cassandra would do combat wise. Cause you pick the abilities that work with that and the gear and equipment that work with that. And then you get to kind of be that. And you're just like, fuck it. I'm the fire bringer, baby. For I'm sure. going to show up in this conquest battle and yeah. do that. Uh, yeah. I loved using the hero rush and the, whatever the thing was that there's this really nasty, like, stealth ability where a hero strike i think where you use your assassination damage in combat and the animation is sick as hell and i was able to stack some equipment that reduced the cooldown for that ability very significantly so i was able to use it a lot more often right which is kind of the only way to make combat really viable with a stealth focused build so just like you i had this different experience of like i got to customize my combat style to actually be what i would want it to be and that 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 should get at some points. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it it definitely felt rewarding when it's like, the problem is is there was a lot of grind to get there. But yeah. once I got there, it was like okay, like I feel like I accomplished something. Um, right. Because yeah, like I pretty much combat became a science for me at a certain point because I'd run in, I would I would light my blades on fire, go to the toughest enemy, do an overpower attack, and then. Usually I have enough to do another overpower attack, and then I could yeah. uh, do the, I forget the name of the ability, but it's where you stab them and generate adrenaline points each time. I would deplete my adrenaline and then use that, get it back up, and then I would keep going. And and uh, the elemental damage and stuff, you know, I could spread it to a bunch of enemies and just let it slowly take their health down. This became less useful with mercenaries because they're very spongy. The thing about Odyssey is, compared to Origins Combat at least, is like Origins Combat... All the abilities that aid you in combat feel supplementary. Odyssey abilities feel like if you don't have them, you're not experiencing the combat in any in any positive way. And so yeah, that's fair. That's not that's not to say because like you could say that about like a Dragon Age game. I'm just making yeah. the, the, the the distinction that Odyssey combat is more like Dragon Age than it is like Origin. It's more abilities focused than it is about the actual process of right. You're in a combat encounter, you're stabbing, you're dodging, yeah. you're parrying, etc. And that's why I ultimately prefer Origins because I, I, I prefer that focus over like, let me just use my abilities. 
but I, I, I give credit where credit is due. It does feel at least somewhat realized as an ability focused combat system. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's honestly what I liked about, about Odyssey is that the abilities gave me something to think about. It was like on a macro level, choosing the abilities that would actually best suit my play style and character build, but on a micro level, how I'm using them in combat, how am I juggling their cooldowns? Uh, who am I targeting when I use those abilities? There was a lot more for me to actually be processing than in Origins where I felt like a lot of the time it, it wasn't really strategic in combat. Like, yeah, there's the kind of strategy that happens in any combat encounter where you might choose to focus on the enemy with the lowest health or the enemy that's being the biggest pain in the ass. But because there's not really much to do as far as tools or moves or combos or things outside of your your regular move set, uh, you know, it didn't it didn't tickle my brain right. I was just stabbing and dodging and parrying and and ad nauseum because those those enemies were often so fucking spongy in Origins. I felt like we, we you and I will probably just for for time eternal have to agree to disagree when it comes to <laughs> combat in Assassin's Creed. Yeah, I, well, yeah. Because we never agree. We never agree on AC combat. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, Odyssey. I feel like I'm out of things to say. <laughs> it's a complicated game. It's. It, I think it's fair. The people who are like, you know what, fuck this game entirely because there's no Assassin's Creed in it. I'm like, yeah, I get you. I also think the people who are like, you know what? I actually enjoyed this game for what it is. I see why someone would enjoy it. You know what I mean? Like I get it. There are I things do, but I also enjoy. like. I don't understand how you view Odyssey as like this incredible game, and yet like you don't think something like 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 Witcher Three does that a million times better. You know what I mean? I well well you're you're saying the general you, not me specifically, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Because I was gonna say I don't think Odyssey's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no um yeah no i i i will agree there there are many games that have done what odyssey does a lot better but i see the allure of that that sort of the gameplay loop of both odyssey and origins they're pretty similar in both with the forts and the stealth puzzles that may or may not be present in them and leveling up your character like it is it works on our brains that's the thing even though we recognize that it's cynical and frustrating and we kind of hate it like when we play these games we get somewhere in that that dopamine loop of i'm gonna clear this fort i'm gonna complete this objective i'm gonna get that gear you know Lousa. yeah last episode i think it was yeah it was last episode uh <laughs> two years you guys ago were saying that episode. like the fort stuff and everything was was worse than odyssey I don't think it's worse. I think nah. it's it's worse, I guess, by the metric of that there is more of it to do. But plenty yes. of main quests and stuff like send you to Forge just like Origins does. So I have to give Odyssey credit. It doesn't do anything Origins didn't. There's just so much more of it. I think in the context of that, we might have been talking about the the prospect of having to do all of it because there is, I think, more of it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If in that case, hundred percent. Yeah. For sure. But as as far as the main story is concerned, yeah. No. I mean, not going to be that that challenging to when I when I hundred percent of these games, it took me sixty hours to hundred percent Origins and and literally clear every single map marker, uh, including doing the story. Odyssey, that number is about ninety hours. But of course, Valhalla, that number is like 120. So really interesting how those have escalated. And Odyssey has a shit fuck ton of side quests. And, you know, uh, only other thing I can touch about as far as Odyssey is concerned. I mean, I would say maybe a thing or two about the modern day or the fucking. Oh, boy, I forgot shit, there was but, modern day in this game. Uh, me too. It didn't even. Yeah, it didn't oh. even register on my on my on my weather forecast. <laughs> There's not much to say about it either, other than that it's dumb and it's, bad. And it's it about as bad as Origins is, and it's not much. But I guess Valhalla is just better simply because it's it's better presented. But eh, I guess yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. So Odyssey, we've been on a real Odyssey. In some ways, we've we've been on an Odyssey with this entire podcast, which is over a year old now. We've been doing this. That's something. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, it is. Jesus. We started Christ. in April. I think we started in April or May of 2020. Jesus. Um, I certainly didn't think we'd last this long. <laughs> so that's what she said. <laughs> hey yo. 
but we're done now. This is <laughs> this is it. I don't know how to how to like make it sound better. Look, there's a lot of just egregious, terrible bullshit going on at Ubisoft right now. And if we had not said on the last episode, oh, we're going to do Odyssey. <laughs> it's time to do Odyssey. If we had not said that, I think we both would have decided not to do this episode at all to just end the, end the podcast right there. Because it, beyond what we think about the the game series and its trajectory as a whole, Lord knows there's a lot to be cynical about there. Um, it's also just not fun to be avid members of a fan community for a product that is made by Ubisoft where over the last year, since the initial news broke of the terrible work environments, hostile work environments, sexual harassment, um, and over the last year, despite Ubisoft's insistences to the contrary, uh, it sure seems like not a lot of that has been addressed or resolved. And uh, honestly, mm, fuck that shit. Fuck yeah. Ubisoft. I don't want to support them. If, if none of that was happening, it's possible. I might have said fuck it and uh, bought the DLCs for Odyssey so I could actually have played those and talk about them but at this point i don't want to give ubisoft any of my goddamn money so yeah i don't see how we can keep doing a fan podcast for a franchise that at this point uh, w- without some uh, acknowledgement of these issues without there being tangible change the next assassin's creed game could come out this month and i wouldn't buy it that's how i feel right now and that's completely independent of me not liking these. Because honestly, if I played Valhalla for 120 hours, despite it being the game it was, you know I would play the next one. I'd yeah. play it. I'd subject myself to whatever garbage it could end up being. But I don't want to give them money. I just don't. And I don't want to be a podcast that is advertising their products. Uh, not that I think we're set pushing any copies on the show, but we're definitely celebrating it in a certain way that's that's maybe inappropriate right now. I think so. I mean, it sounds like ridiculous, like coming after like actual like serious shit of people like going through ridiculous circumstances that need to be corrected. But like generally speaking as well, even before this shit was going on, it was like our Assassin's Creed uh, commitment was just deteriorating because of everything. And now this is like just the final straw, like. It's 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 difficult to be a fan of something that like is not being made for you anymore, and especially now that it's being made by certain people who are not being held accountable and uh, are are not representing values that you as a consumer or player have. Um, and so, ideally, those things get addressed. You know, UB Forward is coming up. Hopefully, they will actually acknowledge something within UB Forward and not in a yeah. like pre-made video before it. Uh, like last time, <laughs> Jesus, man. Could, could, I mean, just think about that. Literally, last UB Ford, we were having this whole debacle, and they didn't address it during it. I think that will be indicative of some actual change if they mention it on their fucking live stream. Probably not, though. Probably not, though. And honestly, like, I mean, let me be clear. I feel silly even doing this at the end of this episode, you know, like. We've just spent an hour talking about Assassin's Creed Odyssey and now we're bringing out the heavy shit. And, you know, I'm sorry that we did it that way, but it wasn't like there was really a better way to do it. Um, It's just that this is the situation and, you know, we didn't want to just drop off the face of the earth without telling you guys what we're doing. But that's part of why this episode took so long for us to make, too, you know. And if we had and if we had done it first, it would have been like, hey, here's all this garbage that's going on at Ubisoft. Anyway, let's talk about Assassin's Creed Odyssey. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, there's really no good way to do it, but but yeah, I think like many people in the Assassin's Creed uh, fan community, we're definitely we're we're still in the process of figuring out like what our actual place is in it and what there is to say or do about any of it because there are no easy answers to these questions. Uh, we just know that we can't really be doing the podcast the way that we have. Yeah, so. We just want to say thank you so much for listening to, to these 34 episodes. Uh, we hope that 
in the last really, really fucking shitty and okay. My dogs are being really, really loud. I'm certain the mic is picking them up. Oh yeah, I can hear that. Holy fuck! I I gotta give them a moment. <laughs> Thank you so much to anyone who's listened to to any of these episodes, or even if if this is your first one. Thank you for listening to this episode, um, and we hope that during this really troubling year that we've all had, and this really weird and frustrating and plague and shit and all this garbage all year long, it would be it would be lovely to think that uh, any of your guys's days were made any better by listening to this podcast. Um, I hope that was the case for, for some of you because we did have fun for the most part making it, I think. And I think it's very probable, very possible, if not probable that, uh, Tim and I will keep doing something. We'll, we'll do something. We don't know what it is yet, but fuck it, Tim. I like podcasting. Do you like podcasting? Yeah, it's okay. We, we might find <laughs> another podcast to do or something. I like it all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going away forever, probably, but but Hookblade, as, as we know it right now, is done. Yeah, definitely taking a step away from Assassin's Creed generally, which will be nice, yeah. I think, for both of us to do. And if you have any thoughts in, that you want to share of like something you'd like to see us try our hands at next uh, or something you'd like to see us do, let us know, uh, you know, because... We're creatively bankrupt, and we're mostly out of ideas. Yeah, if if nothing if nothing is suggested, we're gonna have to start a Resident Evil podcast. <laughs> we're gonna introducing the Resident Mass Effect Evil mm-hmm. podcast. <laughs> Tim's been playing Resident Evil. I've never played any of them. <laughs> it, it, well, we've we've both been playing significantly better games than Assassin's Creed. Generally. Much better games than Assassin's Creed. Yeah. That's right. I I've been saying to uh, all throughout my Odyssey playthrough that I'm that I'm gonna have to play through uh, Ghost of Tsushima again as like a palate cleanser. Right. Remind myself what good AC looks like. So I'm looking forward to doing that too. Yeah. Overall, thanks. Uh, actually, thank not, you guys. Thanks. Uh, I well, mean, uh, I, thanks. I'm kind of speaking generally to like Assassin's Creed. Like, I can't really say thank you to Assassin's Creed. So uh, it's <laughs> it's it's Look, been something. It's been a big part of our lives for a long time. You know how they say it's been a pleasure. Well, it has. <laughs> as much as Assassin's Creed kind of sucks, and maybe always has kind of sucked, I I will always have a special place for it in my heart. And and hey, Tim, uh, you got to think of it this way: without Assassin's Creed, would we be friends? Would we know each other? Um, yeah, probably not. <laughs> as as our friend Arakli um, said on Twitter recently, it with no irony, maybe the real Assassin's Creed was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> I think that sums it up perfectly, and that's probably a good note to end on. I have been the blade. And I've been the hook. And we won't see you next week. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Love you guys. Oh, fuck.